Hi, and welcome to Read Becca. I have read all of River Solomon's previous works, except for maybe some short stories. And for me, they are a master of weaving in real history to speculative fiction and keeping that kernel of reality as the most harrowing element. So today we are talking about Sorrowland. The story is all about Vern, a 15-year-old wife to Reverend Sherman, the leader of the Blessed Acres of Cain, which is a Black nationalist, isolationist religious cult. And Vern is also an albino, which means she has some vision problems resulting from that, so she has never learned to read. But she is incredibly smart and has learned from every person around her. And what that means at this sect is mostly survivalism and self-reliance. So Vern is also pregnant, and she is about to give birth when she decides she cannot bring a new life into this cult, and she must flee into the forest. So she escapes into the forest, and at the start of this novel she is giving birth, and she gives birth to twins. So most of part one is focused entirely on her survival with these twins in the quiet isolation of the forest. As she is caught up in her life with the twins, her body begins to change in strange ways that she doesn't understand. So she's losing control of herself, and there is in the forest a fiend who is beset, causing problems for her. She's quite sure this fiend is real, although she also is experiencing delusions or hauntings that Reverend Sherman said were caused by detoxifying from the outside world. So she doesn't really know what to do about any of these things, and at some point she reaches a, a breaking point and leaves the forest, walking out, and she finds a biker woman who she starts up a casual relationship with. When this happens, she returns to the forest, apologizing to her babies and swearing she will never leave again. But this sets in motion her realization that she cannot stay in the forest forever. So she keeps going back and making contact with the spiker woman, continues the relationship, and this sets off in action her recognition that she needs to find out what is going on with her. She decides she's going to find her previous best friend, Lucy, who she has told her children is their father. And Lucy is someone who escaped the cult previously. So she starts looking for Lucy, determines she would also like to know what is going on with her body and the secrets of Cain Land. So this sets her off on a path to leave the forest. The story starts very slow and atmospheric, with all of part one taking place in the forest, with just Vern and her children for the most part. Once she leaves the forest, parts two and three increasingly gain pace and strangeness. So once she finally does leave the forest and venture out into the wider world, she encounters people who are helpers, who don't really care about her unusual circumstance, they're just there for her. And one of those people is a Lakota third gender or two-spirit individual who she comes to be in a relationship with. And this person is also a trained medic who can help her with the issues that she's having with her body. So Vern, as well on the gender element, uh, rejects traditional gender herself and has rejected that for her children as well. So at moments we see um, someone comments on the children and assumes they're both boys and assumes they're both girls and Vern gets exasperated and says they're both children. So really great gender representation here, which is a pretty standard element for River Solomon. For me, this is the richest work from a prose standpoint from Solomon so far to date. Because I read this on ARC, I cannot quote you anything that I cannot verify against the finished copy, so I'm going to read off the first few lines of the book. The child gushed out from twixt Vern's legs, ragged and smelling of salt. Slight he was and feeble as a promise. He felt in her palms a great wilderness, 
such a tender thing as he could never be parsed fully by the likes of her. Had she more strength, she'd have limped to the river and drowned him. It'd be a gentler end than the one the fiend had in mind. So just extremely gorgeous writing. So looking back to past work, The Deep had a major plot focus on the collective memory of trauma. And this as well incorporates that significantly. It is not the whole narrative, but it is a major element. Mm -hmm. So we see that in part one, we are alternating between Vern currently in the forest and getting her individual trauma. And then also seeing some more generational trauma when we split back to backstory of her childhood in Caneland. So as well, in part two and three, once we zoom out more, we start to see the broader trauma of Caneland. And even beyond that, because of the incorporation of indigenous peoples, we also go past that to her challenging the understanding that she had about the exploitation of the Black people, where effectively at Caneland she had been taught that uh, her her people were taking back the land that they were owed due to slavery. But now she is being forced to question whose land they are taking. So this is very much focused on the exploitation of Black bodies, but with the inclusion of Indigenous people, we see that expanded out to people of color as a whole. In terms of content, the book has some very extreme homophobia, and Caneland is against biracial relationships as well. So that is something to be aware of for sure. In addition, there is a lot of violence and gross content, but for me, the way that it is written, it is kind of skimmed over. So at the very beginning, for instance, some of the ominous messages that the fiend leaves for Vern is in fact animal bodies. But that is about as descriptive as it gets. Um, It doesn't go into grotesque detail. So for me, this is more vivid writing than grotesque writing. So for an example, and I'm going to read something that is bloody here. So if you do not want to hear that, um, skip a couple seconds. So this is the kind of writing of gross content that I'm talking about. Blood spurted out, soda from a shaken can. It warmed Vern's face with its silky red splendor. So that would be an example of something, and it doesn't really linger or focus heavily on things. Um, It doesn't describe in massive detail. So like I said, to me, that is more vivid and not grotesque, but it may not be for everyone. Beyond that, there is also this element where when Vern's body begins changing, there is some self-harm. So again, it's the way that this is written for me. It is, in fact, not in the same sense that we would talk about uh, mental illness and self-harm. This is more of an external expression of damage. So the way it's written is quite different from what you would expect when you're hearing that term. So there are very few things in this book that are not done well as far as I'm concerned. But just a couple of things to mention. The first one is there is a very strange, very graphic sex scene. Um, And I think my read on it is that it is meant to impart healing from the effects of homophobia, but it just is so bizarre and so graphic that um, it kind of got me out of left field. The other one is that toward the end, we have a very lengthy basically a villain monologue explaining everything that has gone on. So I think, you know, we see that in in films and stories a lot where it's a very tropeful of having the villain cornering the protagonist and they go on a monologue about all of their plans. Well, this basically falls into that. So that's how we really uncover what is happening here. Um, We had things seeded throughout, but I wish it had been a little bit 
more naturally broken down throughout the plot. So those are really my only two uh, items that I had knocks on. Otherwise, I absolutely love this story. Um, I'm anxiously awaiting my physical copy here. Um, and I'm very grateful that I was able to request and receive a copy of this from FSG. Thank you very much. And thank you to River Solomon, the author, uh, not just for this being granted to me by my request for review, but also for writing this wonderful work.